trucks. Today we are excited and um, pleased to have you uh, again here, both this and online. Uh, today we're starting uh, a new series of chat seminars, the whole uh, series of chat seminars. And stay, we stay tuned for the rest of the semester as we have excellent speaker. Today we're starting as well with an excellent speaker. We're having Jordan uh, Willett uh, present a part of the work he's done as uh, part of the work he's done as a PhD student in, uh, here at UIUC. So here's a brief, uh, brief introduction of uh, Jordan. Jordan is a PhD candidate at uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering Department here at UIUC. He joined in 2018, and he's working on various, uh, working on various topics of uh, concrete and asphalt pavements. Uh, he had his master's in applied sciences from a good organization in Montreal, and uh, he has he had his bachelor in construction engineering from the same school. Please help me uh, welcome Jordan. And uh, just a, uh, as a kind of reminder, Jordan will have 35 minutes for uh, the presentation, and then he'll have 10 minutes uh, for questions and answer. So kindly hold, uh, hold your questions to after the presentation. We'll take questions both uh, from the people here and from um, online, uh, the people Zoom. And uh, the stage is yours, Jordan. Thank you, Wathik. Let's do a sound check first uh, with people online. Is the audio good? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Ademen. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, like Wafik said, my name is Jordan Wallet, and I will be presenting some advancements on roller compacted concrete, uh, mixed design, and laboratory testing. So, first of all, uh, outline of the presentation, I will do first some acknowledgments. I will give a brief introduction on roller compacted concrete pavements. Some recent developments that were done uh, here at the U of I, mixed design advances, some lab testing advances, current research that's being done in our laboratory, and finally some questions. So first of all, uh, let me try to hide this one here. Hide floating, okay. This research wouldn't have been possible without uh, great support from Professor Raisler that couldn't make it today. He's celebrating his uh, 25th uh, wedding anniversary. So congratulations to him. And uh, Professor Alkadi here, uh, Professor Tutumluer and Popovich that were sitting on my prelim committee. Professor Emeritus Thompson, uh, Dr. DeSantis, Dahal, Sen, graduate research assistant Gail, Connor, Jesus Richa, Omar Karthik that were able to join today and undergraduate research assistants, Molly, Edward, and Ben. So thank you guys for, for the help. Some sponsors are the Roller Compacted Concrete Pavement Council that's been supporting the research, the Department of Civil Engineering here at the U of I, ICT for having me today here, Vulcan Materials, Prairie Materials, and Cimex for sponsoring materials for this research. Let's do now a, a brief history on RCC pavements. It's rather recent in the realm of pavements. The first modern RCC pavement was done in the mid 70s for a, a log sorting yard in British Columbia, Canada. So something pretty small, 19,000 square yard. And if we scale that up today, the largest RCC pavement currently that was built in early 2000s for a Honda plant is 1.5 million square yard. So we can see that within a few decades, this material has been blooming. Uh, why has it been blooming? Why RCC pavements now? There were a lot of advances in equipment uh, for pump mill mixers that are mobile mixers we can bring directly to the site and high density pavers as well that has a dual set of tamping bars. So that's helping to uh, pave and, and uh, compact RCC pavements. RCC pavements are pretty simple uh, and efficient in terms of construction compared to other concrete pavements. No forms are required. Uh, finishing is not required either, and you don't need any steel. So it goes pretty quickly whenever you pave RCC. Sustainability and cost is a little bit better than conventional concrete pavements. Uh, the cement content is lower. The initial pavement cost, therefore, is gonna be lower. 
And a lot of contractors already have pavers and rollers. So that's a very important thing. Getting a new slip form paver is a huge investment and a very uh, difficult area to enter in, but pretty, mo pretty much all paving contractors have pavers and rollers. So that could explain why RCC payments are blooming. You can open RCC payments pretty early to traffic within 24 hours compared to a conventional uh, concrete pavement. That's pretty quick. And finally, one of the biggest reason I think is the academic interest uh, in, the, in these recent year and therefore funding. We can see the number of publications on that uh, graph here in the 2000s has been exploding. Uh, and that's mainly from emerging and developing countries. You can see most publications are being done by other countries than the US, China, Canada, or India, for example. So this is pretty trendy right now, and there's a lot of uh, research effort going on. Now, what is RCC? It has the same constituents as concrete pavements, but in different proportions. So how we can call that, what type of concrete it is, it's a lean, no slung concrete. And if we look at that in terms of the volumetric constituents, Portland cement concrete, of course, has uh, cement, water, air, sand, intermediate size aggregate, and coarse aggregate. In terms of RCC, you have less cement, less water with a, a lower water cement ratio, less air because it's compacted, and that that's a constitute the paste fraction. And then you add way more sand than conventional concrete. Same uh, amount of intermediate size, a little bit more coarse aggregate. So that's the volumetric difference in, in these mixtures. So of course, there's less paste. Uh, there's a higher aggregate fraction on it. So conventional concrete is going to be, of course, way more fluid and have a, um, a closer surface versus RCC. You can hold it in your hand. It's like soil. And then it's going to have a coarser surface finish, a bit like a, a, a base course for an HMA pavement. Why is RCC unique? It's tested like soils. It's paved like asphalt. And you design it like concrete. So it's like a beast in its own that has concepts and a lot of different phases. You transport it with dump trucks. You pave it with a paver like asphalt. You roll it like you would roll a, a granular base or an HMA pavement. And then you design it once it's hardened like a concrete pavement. The behavior is not only explained by concrete material science. That's the tricky part. You can't say, oh, because it's concrete, it has the same properties as conventional concrete. We have to use approaches from different materials. And soils and uh, aggregate um, mechanics are relevant to RCC in terms of full water pressure, in terms of effective stress and all these concepts. And uh, construction process is very similar to HMA. Current applications of RCC pavements, mainly commercial and industrial uh, for ports and intermodal facilities, military airfields for um, uh, military and, and civilian applications too. Heavy loaded whole roads for forestry, mining, uh, that's very common. Low speed roadways, residential, local streets, and, and parking shoulders, and distribution centers and parking. That's mainly where RCC is being used. This material is not perfect, far from there. It's pretty recent, so we have a lot of challenges with it. And one of, of these big challenges are that this material is being mainly led by the commercial sector. So contractors mainly design, pave, and do the whole work. And there are a limited amount of skilled contractors. Uh, and therefore, the engineering experience and specifications are uh, kind of limited um, for, let's say, public use or, or public specifications. The mixed design process is very empirical. The constituents and proportion, proportions are not optimized. The approval is mainly being done on compressive strength. So one of the only criteria to design RCC is the compressive strength. So we know that when it's time to pave it, hardened strength is just something you obtain later on. But when you actually use the material, it needs to be constructible. And that's a challenge when we do mixed design. There are limited testing procedures that are, of course, limited to strength. And most are applicable to RCC dams only. So that means our testing procedures, our ASTM standards or, or, or other uh, instances, do not really apply to RCC pavements. So mostly test sections are needed. They do a test strip, contractors in their backyard. It's expensive, it takes time. You need to mobilize a team that's super expensive and they're lacking testing procedures to predict performance. 
Well, these are the challenges we currently have regarding RCC payments. How do we construct them? Uh, like I mentioned, they are paid and compacted. We can see that right after it's paid, a little bit like HMA payments, you can walk on it. It has enough capacity to be able to directly stand on it. And they use high density pavers that can be different from HMA pavers. And the rollers, um, well, the paver is gonna bring the material from zero to 90% compaction, depending on which pavers you have. And the rollers bring it from 90 to 95, 98, depending on specifications. And that's how they're being constructed. If you have an inadequate mixture, of course, you might have issues in the field like difficulty paving it, have uh, homogeneity. You can have variable compaction through depth. Your pavement is not compacted on the bottom uh, of the pavement. You can have poor finishing, excessive roll down. Roll down is when the roller is sinking in the material we can see. And these are difficult to, whenever that they're too, the roll down is too important, it's difficult to finish and get a smooth surface finish. You can have poor edge support since there are no forms. Uh, you want that edge to be standing by itself when you're compacted. But if you have an inadequate mixture or compaction, uh, a construction procedure, you can have these edge uh, issues. And it leads to a longer opening time. And we know today, time is money. People want their pavements uh, right away. So we want to make sure we have adequate mixtures to do so. And one of the biggest items uh, that led our research is that there are no or very few quality control tests that can detect performance issues. So you need to pave your pavement. And then once it's paved, you realize, ah, I had an issue with my mixture. So it's very problematic for both contractors, client, and uh, designers as well. So what we have currently regarding laboratory tests, uh, we have a modified Proctor test that's been used, same modified Proctor we use for soils. You know who has run the modified Proctors here by hand? Anyone? It's tough, right? It's very, very labor intensive. There is a mechanical hammer uh, that it's a standard for RCC C1435. That's Yale Stone here, the compacting assemble. And um, it is, it has a variable energy. It's a demolition hammer you use to compact the sample. And there is also a VIB apparatus that's used for uh, mainly RCC dams. Uh, and it has full repeatability. So this is the test we currently have for RCC. Recent methods include density with a gyratory compactor. However, it just measure, measures the density. It doesn't evaluate compatibility or any performance. Some limitations is that there's no direct measure of field fresh performance. So if I give you, you know, a proctor value of 2437, is it good? Is it not good? We don't really know. It's not performance related. RCC mix design. How do we currently design RCC mixtures? That's like an equivalent of maybe super paid that is a method to bring you uh, from materials all the way to a mixed design. What we have is two different methods. The Army Corps of Engineer that is based on concrete consistency and ACI method that basically, that's here cementitious content and compressive strength. So you aim 5,000 PSI for your, your RCC pavement. Then this chart is gonna tell you, you use like 12.6% cement. It's very empirical. It's very, very um, subjective. So this is what currently contractors deal with. The cement content is not optimized, of course, for your aggregates. It's not sustainable. The aggregate properties are not integrated. So what if you want to use local aggregates? You want to use recycled aggregates. It's very complicated. Contractors sometimes prefer holding a known source of aggregate over a longer distance. It's, it costs money. It's expensive. It causes delays. So this is a limitation with the current mixed design method. And obviously multiple iterations are needed. So you, you do a mixed design in your laboratory, you go outside, you paint it, ah, it doesn't work well. Go back inside, change water content, go back outside, call your team, call the superintendent, hey, we're painting to you. You know, it's a lot of iterations and a lot of efforts. Luckily, there are some theoretical approaches, including the solid suspension model. And the, the idea behind it is to uh, minimize your void in your aggregate content. And then the optimal pace volume method, that's to select the pace content to overfill that void structure. So our research is gonna focus or gonna get inspired from these two concepts. And uh, whenever today, 
you, you paid your RCC payment and you don't have an appropriate performance. Contractors rely on this table. It's very small, it's very complicated. And what it does basically is you have issues on top here and uh, here may be approaches to solve your problem. So it's a very empirical way to optimize or um, uh, get your RCC payment mixture better with these kind of charts. So that ends uh, introduction. That's what's currently being done with RCC payments. And there are many uh, challenges that can be over, um, overcame. Some recent advances regarding the mixed design approach is understanding volume metrics of, of RCC. And then using mixed design metrics, quantify these volume metrics in the laboratory. I'll explain that in detail later on. And then some advances on laboratory performance testing including the green properties, how to prepare RCC samples, evaluate constructability with the gyratory compactor, like the superplate method, um, similar to it, and then the DCP uh, in the field and both in the laboratory. So I'll be explaining that in detail in the next slides. Regarding RCC volume metrics, it doesn't have a constant volume RCC like conventional concrete. Whenever you batch it, it's going to have a lot of voids. Uh, it's going to be a bolt material. And whenever you compact it, you'll end up with less voids in your structure. So the, the void content is not constant through time. And that's a big headache because currently, concrete mixed designs are mostly made by weight. So that means for RCC, we need to integrate a concept of volume in there. And uh, opposed to conventional concrete, RCC is not aggregates floating in a matrix of paste. It's a continuous skeleton of aggregate that is touching each other, and you have pace to fill that board structure. But this is a different uh, approach we have to use. So these phase diagrams I'm talking about, these old dimensions, can be expressed with a phase diagram. Like for soils, for you, I'm sure you have seen that. It's, sometimes it's a headache. Some people don't like it. It's complicated. But we need it to understand volumes and how they would eventually affect performance. So what's the idea? To make our own ooh, that figure is not showing well. Um, quick solution, quick solution, what could we do? Let me try to escape maybe PowerPoint, see if it shows in the presentation. It doesn't show either. Any ideas? Can you see it on your screen? No, I can't see it. Let's enable it. Doesn't show either. Maybe let's I. You can go to the other picture format. Yeah. Transparent. Yeah. Correction. No, it doesn't show. No, I don't have it on either slide. It just. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll improvise it. So the idea that, uh, behind our phase, RCC phase diagram is to take, I'll hide that so that way you focus on what I'm saying, is to take an aggregate structure without cement and paste. It has voids right in that structure. Once you compact it, you reduce that amount of voids to a minimal void. There's still going to be spaces inside the aggregates. So the idea behind that phase diagram is to use a certain amount of paste in that void structure to underfill is when you put paste, but not enough to fill everything. Equifill, whenever you exactly fill that void structure. And overfill, whenever you put more paste than what the void structure has. And what happens when you do that is that you're going to loosen your aggregate structure. You're going to unpack your aggregates. So you go from a dense aggregate structure to a bulk loosened aggregate structure. So you lose these aggregate contacts. So one concept to understand the, this uh, behavior is to use the ratio of voids filled by paste, a little bit like DFA for HMA mixtures. And that ratio is going to be directly correlated to performance. For conventional Portland cement concrete, we're overfill for durability and, and workability. For HMA pavements, we're underfill for rutting. And uh, for, for if you go too low, though, you can have durability problems. But you go underfill. And RCC, we want to go in the middle. 
We want to equi fill that structure to have right the right amount of pace just to hold these aggregates together. And from these volumetrics, from this phase diagram, we want theoretical performance indicators. You know, like water cement ratio. If I tell you a water cement ratio of 0.1, is it good? 0.1? Or let's say 0.9. Is it, is it going to lead to a good concrete mixture? No, we already know. So the idea is to use these mixed design metrics to have an idea of is my RCC mixture going to lead to probably good performance or not. Same thing for VMA and the binder film thickness or durability and rotting for HMA pavements. We can derive those for RCC. Water cement ratio is not as important. We know that. So we need to normalize, like I said, the pace content to the aggregate volumetry. And this is very important because the aggregate source changes. Uh, we have different aggregate sources, different gradations. We have different volumetrics. And one pace content doesn't suit the man. And uh, we realize that the voids filled by pace is more applicable based on the inner granular voids and the extra granular voids. So just to give you an example, uh, crushed dolomite. Crushed dolomite, that's a dense graded mixture, is going to have way more voids than a natural structure with round gravel and sand. So these two mixtures won't need the same amount of pace for the same behavior. So these are very important to consider in a, in a mixed design. How do we quantify volumetrics? How do we measure that in the lab? We can use a perforated mold. And um, when we use that kind of perforated mold, we get a certain pace content where aggregates are unpacked and we compact the structure. And then the pace that is left inside that uh, sample here is the minimal pace required to equifill the mixture considering that an extra paste was drained. That's a way that we found the laboratory to measure these volumetrics. We can use as well computer vision from a sliced polished sample and then use uh, image editing or image, um, uh, uh, yeah, editing softwares to isolate particles and then calculate a paste film thickness and that calculate inner granular voids. So these are methods we can use in the laboratory on hardened or fresh samples uh, to estimate these volumetrics. So that ends the mixed design part. The lab testing part, uh, we want to aim towards a performance testing, like I mentioned. The standards are limited. It's difficult to assess constructability with the current tests we have. We need test sections. And one of the tests we want to use is the green properties. It's the immediate capacity of an uh, unconfined, freshly compacted R system. So it's unhardened, it's fresh. It's when we saw that person standing on the concrete pavement, on the RCC pavement when it was paved, that is the green uh, capacity of it. It can be measured in the laboratory from a stress strain uh, curve. We mix it, we compact it, we demold it, and then we test it. And all that within 30 minutes. That's very quick. You can correlate that to finishability. And if I show two samples, which, which, which mixture do you think is going to give the better finish? The left one or the right one? Raise your hand. Left one or right one? You say this one's going to lead to a better finish? This one here? Yes. Any, someone wants to, to go against that? Everyone agrees the left one is better? No, Mohammed says no. Say the right one. Yes, the right one's going to leave. Why? Why do you know that? It's brittle, exactly. And how do you quantify that? So stress strain? You deserve a goodie for that. Here you go. So we have uh, three different green properties. Green modulus, the slope here. That's stress strain curve. In a fresh state, green strength. And softening modulus. So these are the indicators that can quantify directly finishability. This one is going to be less brittle. This one crumbles. The softening modulus is super, super steep. It crumbles very quickly. So that's a way to measure finishability in the laboratory. What are these mechanisms? Aggregate type is going to influence the shear potential. You have particle contact zone here. Whenever you're underfill, you maximize these contact uh, between particles. If you overfill, then you unpack 
your, your structure. And the idea is to have adhesive forces between these particles with paste. And it, that's optimal when equifill or slightly overfilled. And what is proper interlocking for, for RCC is when you have high aggregate shear and high adhesive forces. So that's probably why green strength peaks whenever we're around equifilled. Now, how do we prepare samples in the lab? Right now, it's the big mechanical hammer. We know that the wet density is going to be different from different methods, but we know that the, uh, the mechanical hammer here tends to overestimate uh, the density of samples. So density is super important because it's a field uh, contractual acceptance value. So you need to reach a certain percentage of that density you reach in the laboratory. So if you, re if you measure a wrong density in the lab, then why are you asking that in the, in the field to reach that value that's based on what? So that's why the gyratory compactor is probably better to simulate kneading, the kneading process of the roll of the paper and uh, compactors, and it stops compaction whenever you reach your density. So that famous gyratory compactor, you can evaluate compactability with it. It measures directly uh, compaction energy with a torque cell. So what's good is these now research gyratory compactor have a cell here that measures the force required to rotate your sample. That's a little bit different than the conventional uh, gyratory compactors. And what's great about that? We can transpose energy values here to the field, knowing that a big roller pass is one megajoule per cubic meter. A modified proctor is 2.4, 2.7, I forgot. And a standard proctor is 0 0.9. So you see these lines here? That's the energy of a standard proctor and the energy of a modified proctor. Here you have the compactive energy. And what we have here is two slopes. That blue one is the energy required to bring your material from 0% compaction to 90% compaction. So if, for example, here is the void filled by pace. If I underfill my mixture, if I don't give enough pace between the aggregates, then I'm gonna need more energy here, like equivalent of two roller passes to bring my material from zero to 90% compaction. And then if I wanna bring it from 90 to 95%, then that's the orange curve here. So that means if I underfill my mixture, I need eight roller passes to reach density. That's very, I mean, difficult in, in the field to obtain. So the good thing about that is if you slightly overfill or overfill by 20%, then you need only two, three roller passes, which is more accurate. So that's what the gyratory compactor can show us. And you can directly transpose that to the field. That's a great way to bring laboratory to give something contractors are interested in. Field testing, another thing contractors like, uh, how do you evaluate you paid your material well? You can use a device as simple as a DCP. Uh, it, it's, there's no electronics. It's a steel rod with a weight with a conical tip on it. You drop it a number of blows and you measure uh, a penetration index, and you can correlate that to CDR. Everyone has heard of CDR here? What's a good CDR? 100. 100, okay. Here's another good one. You got it this time. <laughs> so yeah, 100 CDR is, is a good reference. What we see for RCC, that's fresh. We compact it within 30 minutes. We have CBR values as high as 60, 70. That's pretty great for an unhardened concrete mixture. And what we see is there's a peak that's, that's uh, obtained around equifield. The minimum CBR required, uh, according to that reference, is 6.5 for construction traffic. So if you want to pave another layer, for example, over your, your first RCC layer, you need a CBR of 6.5. The worst mixture that, I, that we were able to do in the lab has a CBR of 10. And that's when we overfill the void by 80%. We make a soup out of the mixture. And we still, we're technically still able to put a paper on it and pave a second layer. And the, the minimum CBR is nine to avoid traffic damage. So pretty much all mixtures can achieve that, which is good news. So see the DCP could be a great tool to either test it in the mold, in the lab, and then bring that in your pickup truck to the field and say, yeah, I have the same mixture. Okay, you can put your second paper on. There's you compacted enough. There's no issues. That could be a cool, simple, cheap, and transposable test to use. So that completes the 
uh, advances on mix design. Now we're working on a compaction column to quantify the effect of compaction depth into that and evaluate the drainage uh, effects on RCC with a perforated column like that. With these pressure transducers that we have on the column here, we can measure uh, the indirectly the phase rheology. So we're currently running these tests in the laboratory and uh, hopefully we'll have some updates or papers soon on that. So that's where we're leading uh, towards uh, RCC research. So I'll be uh, more than happy to get your questions or discussions if you want. If you can't, you have to leave for some reason. Here's my email address, LinkedIn. Please reach out. Uh, I'll be, like I said, more than happy to have a discussion and uh, discuss RCC or any other materials. Thank you. We have a good time for questions, so we can go first with the people that are uh, making work very nice presentation. Uh, I was wondering, what is the motivation to use RCP? Like, what kind of situation does Jake go stay in RCP? So, when um, application that is very popular is these uh, whole roads that are pretty remote. So like remaining camps or uh, forestry. So it's these area where you have limited supplies and you, uh, you have a lot of aggregates around luckily because you're blasting for road, for example. And cement is, you know, uh, pretty easy to hold too. You don't need any temperature control or you can stock it pretty easily. So I would say these applications are ideal for RCC um, and very high, high loads, low speed applications. So uh, intermodal, parking lots, distribution centers, um, uh, military use aprons for airports. Wherever uh, you, you use conventional concrete, you can technically use RCC except for high speed applications. Does it offer any reduction in emissions compared to the normal concrete? Like, is there a benefit of using it on the environment side? Uh, definitely. The cement content is reduced up to maybe 30%. So the cement content needed is lower. Uh, and since it has a good aggregate skeleton to, to hold up some weight whenever you compact it, you can use supplementary cementitious materials that are going to eventually harden a little later by a uh, pozzolanic reaction, for example. So you don't really need that quick cement hydration uh, like for conventional Portland cement concrete. So you, the way to, to, to see uh, RCC as more sustainable is less cement and incorporation of other cementitious uh, replacement materials. Uh, have you looked at using RCC with any like inert fillers, like the limestone inert fillers, inert fillers that aren't necessarily cementitious? So one issue with fillers is that they have a very high uh, specific surface area. And for concrete, we know that very fine particles of filler tend to increase water demand. And uh, you know, when you increase water, you increase water cement ratio, have potentially uh, durability issues. So we tend to reduce Whenever we do our gradation, we tend to reduce the passing number 100 maybe, uh, that's 630 microns. So for that reason, if it's not a, cement, a, a supplementary cementitious materials and it has no hardening properties, I know fine uh, micronized limestone or fine limestone does, so that probably be, could be good. But we tend to stay away from pillars for RCC. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation and really nice work. Um, I'm just curious, so regular PCP, you have some texturing technique for the surface friction. What is done for RCC after the fact? That's a very good question. Since we use mostly RCC payments for low speed application, usually surface finish does not matter as much like for highways, for example. However, some contractors are going to uh, use a screed to um, uh, kind of understand that. Is that my Siri? <laughs> that, that's the Siri there. 
So they're going to use a street to, to give surface texture, or even sometimes going to use a helicopter to polish it, like give it a, a mirror finish. So there are possibilities to have you know, a, a nice surface finish, but it requires more work, obviously. But usually for low speed application, we just leave it uh, like it is. And it looks like, I don't know, maybe a 20, 20 millimeter HMA mixture, uh, nominal size. So like half inch, pretty coarse, coarsely looking material. Um, but there are other alternatives and options. Some people even grind it, uh, but you know, it's, it adds some money and time to it. We have uh, more questions. Are there any paver modifications required? You said they can use asphalt pavers. Do they need to do anything to the hopper or the screen, or is it good to go? They currently sell, uh, Vogel have, and Vogel and Vogel, they sell RCC pavers now. Um, since it's been booming a little bit, they have a dual set of camping bars that is going to, at a very high frequency before the screen, the vibrating screen plate. There's a set of camping bars, and now the pavers these days have a dual set of camping bars. So you have, you know, if you pave that direction, you have two camping bars that are going to need your material, and then you have the vibrating street table that pushes on it and finishes it. Wow. But you can technically use a conventional paver to pave RCC. However, instead of having 90% convection at the end, you might have 83, 85, 87. I don't know what HMA typically is, but maybe in that realm. 83, 85%. So you'll have to roll it a little bit more uh, if you use a standard paper. I have a small question. I'm very interested to know how many passes do you think will be in all of this? Like I'm trying to compare it to HMA. Is it more rolls or less rolls? Do you have any? Yeah. It depends on your mixture, to be honest. It depends on your, your base content. So it can vary depending on what the client's objective is. If the client wants to pay a little bit more to have a better finish and have more paste, likely you'll need to roll it a little bit less. But that's from one mixture. Currently we're testing maybe 10 different aggregates in the laboratory. But if you use that as an example, if you wanna, let's say the number of passes you need to bring your material from 90% 90, 90 infection to 98 or 95. Here is the compactive energy required. So you have, Let's say if, you, if we fill six megajoules to the meter, that would be six roller passes, a big roller, 15, 18 tons. But if you overfill your mixture, you give it more pace, then you'll need, you know, maybe two passes. But I would say in average, you'll need maybe four or five passes or three passes total. So if you have three rollers and you have one pass per roller. And what's kind of cool with that is you don't have to bother about temperature, but you have to bother about moisture loss. So if it's very hot, very windy, you might end up with moisture loss. And then it's like if your HMA pavement is cooling, you know, you need to either compact faster or bring other rollers up. So I would say it depends on contractors, what size of rollers they have, how performing their paver is, what mixture to use. But that can range from zero passes a roller to three, four passes. They call uh, today a uh, compacted concrete pavement, CCP, it's a new term for RCC. When you use admixtures in a super uh, intense paver that does all the compaction, you don't even need to roll it. Uh, so this is possible, but it's emerging right now. So I would say varies from zero to six, eight passes, maybe if you have a, a lot of evaporation during the paving. Can take the last question. Actually, I want to follow up on that. You can go back to slide number 24. Okay, so in here, this says, how old was the concrete when you ran it? Within 30 minutes. Within 30 minutes. Now, what you were saying in the next slide, 25, is that, um, you know, you have a contact zone, you have a shear stress that's holding the concrete together, but also you have an adhesive force. Yes. Do you think that there's adhesion at the first 13 minutes of the uh, concrete castle? Oh, definitely. It's like uh, when you build a sand castle, you know, at the beach, when you water your sand, you, know, yeah. you end up having these capillary uh, surface tension pores. So these are these adhesive forces. It's not um, uh, a, a hardening force from the cement phase, but more of a hydraulic phenomenon of 
capillarity and, and uh, surface tension. It's interesting. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I think uh, maybe a new term should be used for that. I just, okay. I immediately just uh, thought this, you know, the cement was come back. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you, Juan. I think now we have more to online questions. We have to open. Okay. So Ferris, uh, hello Ferris, he is um, part of the Roller Compacted Concrete Pavement Council. So he's been supporting us a lot in our research. So he's asking, how do you translate a good finish of a lab cylinder to a good surface finish in the field? That's a very good question. That's a thing we have not studied yet. I know some papers have been published recently with computer vision of taking a, a picture after a deep test on the surface and uh, correlating that um, with a surface finish index with open pores. And so that's being done, but currently we have no direct methods except for a subjective way of looking at it and say, hey, that's a good surface finish or that's not a good surface finish. That's what we uh, we currently do. And Ferris is asking as well, the uh, RCC Pavement Council recommends high density screed for most RCC pavement applications. Screeds producing less than 90% compaction prior to rolling will produce pavement that are less smooth. So what Ferris is saying is he recommends using a high density paver with a, a set of tamping bars or ideally a dual set of tamping bars uh, since it will lead to a smoother finish. Uh, so that's what Ferris is recommending for constructing concrete pavements. But maybe in emerging countries where surface finish is not as important uh, as high-speed applications, uh, maybe it could be adequate to use a conventional paver just to go to a mining road or a holding road instead of a dirt road. Uh, but obviously it is recommended to use appropriate equipment. Jordan, this is uh, Ferris. I thank you so much. This is an excellent presentation. I apologize, I uh, joined in a few minutes late and now I gotta go to another meeting, but I wanted to say thank you so much, wonderful job. Thank you, Ferris. Thank you for supporting our research too. Absolutely, thank you for your uh, good work. Thank you.